Section 20 of Roman History, the Early Empire by William Wolfe Capes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 11, Domitian, A.D. 81 to 96. During Domitian's early years, his father Vespasian was hiding in disgrace. He lived in a little house at Rome so meanly furnished that it had not a single piece of silver plate, and his straitened means may possibly have tempted him to vice, as the scandalous stories of later days asserted. He first attracted public notice when his father headed the movement in the east, but Vitellius still left him unmolested. There was danger, however, from the fury of the soldiers, and he took refuge with his uncle Sabinus on the capital to see the fortress stormed and the defenders slain. He escaped from the massacre in disguise, and lurked for a while in the house of a poor friend in a mean quarter of the town. But succor was near at hand, and the vanguard of his father's army not only brought him safety, but raised him suddenly to unlooked-for greatness. The change was fatal to his modesty and self-control. He aired at once all the insolence of absolute power, gave the rein to his sensual desires, and bestowed all the offices of state at his caprice. Vespasian even wrote in irony to thank him for not appointing a successor to himself. The arrival of Mucianus, the vice-regent of the emperor, put some check upon his license, but it needed all the statesman's authority and tact to temper the arrogance of the headstrong youth. The crisis on the Rhine was pressing, and they set out together for the seat of war, but all was over before they reached Lugdunum, and Domitian detained from going further, is said to have sent fruitless messages to tamper with the fidelity of Cariolus. If he had ever seriously hoped to raise himself to the level of his brother, he had quite failed, and he had gone too far to meet his father's eye without misgiving. To disarm the anger that he dreaded, he feigned even folly and took to hunting flies, for the oft-quoted jest of Vibrius Crispus, that there was no one, not even a fly with Caesar, belongs more probably to this than to a later time. Thanks to his father's tenderness or the entreaties of his brother, he suffered nothing worse than warning words, but Vespasian watched him narrowly henceforth, kept him always by his side, trusted him with no public functions, and flatly refused to let him lead the forces which the Parthian king had sent to beg for in return for his own proffers of support but by this time domitian had learned to bide his time and to be patient he hid his chagrin at being kept thus in the leading strings of childhood and took to poetry coquetting with the muses in default of graver duties at vespasian's death however the old temper broke out afresh at first he thought of outbidding titus by offering the soldiers a bounty twice as large but wanted nerve to appeal to force then he complained that he was kept out of his rights, as his father's will had named him partner to the imperial power, and to the last he tried the long-suffering tenderness of Titus by moody sullenness and discontent, and possibly even by plots against his life. His brother's death soon removed the only obstacle to his ambition, and the only restraint upon his will. But strange to say, wanton and headstrong as he had been before, he now exerted a rare faculty of self-restraint, as if he were weighted with the responsibility of power and wished to win and to deserve the popularity of Titus. He spent some time in quiet every morning to think over his course of action and to school himself for the duties of the day. He saw that justice was the first requisite of social well-being, and he spared no effort to secure it. In the law courts he was often to be seen listening to the pleadings and the sentence given. The judges knew that his eye was on them, and that it was dangerous to take a bribe or to show caprice. Even in distant provinces the governors said that they were closely watched, and never, it is said, did they show more equity and self-restraint than in this opening period of Domitian's rule. His treatment of another class showed a like spirit. The rise and fall of the informers had been a sort of weather gauge of the moral atmosphere around. Since Nero's death, the bolder spirits in the Senate had tried under each emperor in turn 
to bring the false accusers to the bar of justice the leading stoics had come forward smarting with the memory of the friends whom they had lost full of indignant eloquence against the bloodhounds who had hunted them to death the infamous names of marcellus crispus regulus called out an explosion of revengeful sentiment the senate even went so far as to ask that the old notebooks of the emperors might be produced to furnish evidence against the men they hated but little had been really done and men thought they traced the malign influence of mucianus in screening the criminals from attack titus had driven them away in disgrace but now perhaps they were creeping like unclean things out of their hiding places to study the new sovereign's temper they could not be encouraged by the words that dropped from him the prince who fails to chastise informers whets their zeal nor by the penalty of exile fixed for the accuser who brought a charge of defrauding the treasury or privy purse and failed to make it good he tried next to meet a growing evil of the times that was significant of misrule he announced that he would receive no legacies save from the childless and quashed the wills made out of vanity or ostentation to the prejudice of the natural errors not content with such reforms he tried to give a higher moral tone to the social life of the great city to check the license of the theatres to discourage indecent pasquinades and raise the respect for chastity and moral ties had he only ruled as short a time as titus he would have borne as fair a character in history and he would seemingly have deserved it better for he grasped the reins with a firmer hand and wished to merit rather than to win his subjects love how was it that so fair an opening was so sadly clouded or whence the change that came over the spirit of his rule in the meagre account of ancient writers we find no attempt made to solve the problem but we may see perhaps some explanation in the events that happened at the time one thing was wanting still the laurel crown of victory to raise domitian to the level of his brother in an evil hour he coveted military glory and set out for germany where a pretext for war was never wanting but high as was the order of his talents he had neither the general's eye nor the soldier's courage and his heart failed him when he drew nearer to the enemy the german expedition of a d eighty four ended as it began in plundering a few poor villages and in pompous proclamations to the army and the senate but far away toward the danube there was the sound of a real crash of war decibalus at the head of his dacian hordes was an enemy worthy of the most skilful generals of rome bold fertile in resource and skilled in all the fence of war he had drilled and organized a formidable power which for years tried the mettle of the roman armies hither also came domitian to gain his laurels and here too his courage failed him he stayed at the rear away from all the fighting while his legions badly led were driven backward in disgrace unwilling to return without striking a blow to retrieve his tarnished fame he hurried to pannonia to chastise the marcomanni for neglecting to send him succour in the war but thither also he was followed by his evil star instead of the submission that he looked for he found a vigorous defence and he was ensnared and routed by an enemy whom he had thought to find an easy prey sick of war and of its dangers he came to terms with decebalus without delay and rare as it was for a roman leader to conclude a war after defeat he was glad to purchase peace at any cost and to give not money only but tools and workmen to teach the dacian tribes the arts of civilized life he could not face his people with the confession of his failure so lying bulletins went homeward to the senate to tell the victories never won and to disguise the history of the campaigns honours and thanksgivings were voted in profusion the imperial city and the provincial towns accepted the official story and raised with dutiful joy triumphal statues to their prince but the truth leaked out of course and domitian returned to rome an altered man he read mockery in the eyes of all he met detested their praises as gross flattery yet resented silence as a censure he gave costly entertainments to the people but with a gaiety so forced and a mien so changed that men spoke of them currently as funeral feasts 
till at last he took them at their word inviting the senators to a strange parody of a supper in the tombs and played with grim humour on their fears while he was in this capricious mood another event served yet further to embitter him antonius a governor upon the rhine began once more the fatal game of civil war though he was soon crushed and slain and his notebooks burnt to compromise no partisans yet the suspicious fears of domitian were not to be lulled so easily and he fancied universal treachery around him the plot was the motive or excuse for an outburst of vindictive feeling which would not stay to wait for proofs but grew ever more relentless the faster his victims fell like some half-tamed animals we read of he needed to taste blood to reveal to himself and others the ferocity of his feline nature one further cause perhaps there was a frequent one with vicious rulers to tempt him to yet further evil this was simply want of money the fruitless expense of the wars the heavy price he paid for peace the lavish outlay to keep up the farce and put the populace in good humour these had drained the coffers which vespasian had filled and which the easy prodigality of titus had already emptied at first he was minded to economize by reducing the strength or number of the legions but he feared to weaken the thin line of border armies and in his present mood he saw a readier way to fill his treasury the old old story of these evil times fines confiscations and judicial murders became once more the order of the day coloured at times by various pleas but often too by none at all he talked of conspiracies and treasons till his morbid fancy saw traitors everywhere around him his suspicious fears settled at last into general mistrust as the hatred of the world grew more intense the philosophers were among the first to suffer rusticus and senecio died for their outspoken reverence for the great martyrs of their stoic creed and many another suffered with them till by one sweeping edict all were banished from the city and from italy philosophy did not indeed make conspirators but he feared its habits of bold speech and criticism as modern despots are intolerant of a free press and he looked with an evil eye at men who would not stoop to caesar worship as persecuting churches would trample out dissent among those who were brought before him at this time and banished with the rest one name is mentioned that may stand apart that of apollonius of tiana he was it seems a wandering sage so renowned for sanctity and wisdom that a band of admiring scholars grouped themselves around him and were glad to follow him from land to land strange legends of his uncanny power gathered in time about his name and words of more than human insight were reported to feed the credulous fancy of the world in the last phase of the struggle between pagan and christian thought the figure of apollonius was chosen as a rival to the jesus of the gospels and his life was written by philostratus to prove that the religious philosophy of heathenism could show its sermons miracles and inspiration these were hard times for earnest thinkers they were not encouraging for men of action military prowess and success were too marked a contrast to the humbling disasters on the danube to meet with much favour from the emperor but there were few generals of renown to try his temper julius agricola is prominent among them because the skilful pen of tacitus his son-in-law has written for us the story of his life his just firm rule as governor of britain the promptitude with which he swept away the abuses of the past the courage with which he pushed his arms into the far north and brought caledonia within the limits of his province form a bright page in the annals of this period a d eighty five but they gave little pleasure to his jealous sovereign who eyed him coldly on his return to rome and gave him no further chance of service or glory he lived a few years more in modest dignity without a word of flattery yet not desirous to court a useless death by offensive speech when he died men whispered their suspicions of foul play but the emperor who was named among his heirs accepted gladly the token of his respect forgetting his own earlier principles or that as the historian tells us only a bad prince is left a legacy in a good father's will <laughs>
but though he feared serious thought and action the lighter charms of literature might perhaps have soothed the moody prince in earlier days he had turned to poetry for solace and the sad muses whom he had courted in retirement had as juvenal tells us no patron else to look to than the domitian who had just risen to the throne but the emperor read little else himself besides the memoirs of tiberius and the writers of his day had but scant cause to bless his princely bounties marshall with all his ready flow of sparkling verse his pungent epigram and witty sallies had a hard life of it enough at rome and was reduced to cringe and flatter for the gift of a new toga or a paltry dole statius well read and highly gifted as he was with fluency and fancy found it easy to win loud applause when he read his thebaid in public but gained little for his ingenious compliments and conceits as poet laureate of the court and had not means enough at last to find a marriage portion for his daughter juvenal's appeal in favour of the starving muses met seemingly with no response and disappointment may have added to his high-toned vehemence and studied scorn it was no time certainly for tacitus to write without partiality or fear and the condensed vigour of his style its vivid portraiture and power of moral indignation might have been lost wholly to the world had not another emperor come at last to combine monarchy with freedom meantime rome had grown weary of the bloodthirsty mania of its ruler who loved to pounce with stealthy suddenness upon his victims and to talk of mercy when he meant to slay it was the rich the noble the large-hearted who suffered most in his reign of terror and it was left to his wife and freedmen to cut it short finding it is said a notebook in his bed and in it their own names marked down for death they formed their plans without delay it was in vain that domitian was haunted by his warning fears that he had his porticoes inlaid with polished stone to reflect the assassin's dagger in vain he sent for astrologers and soothsayers to read the future he could not be always armed against the enemies of his own household the conspirators surprised him alone in an unguarded moment and dispatched him with many wounds though he struggled fiercely to the last End of section twenty